Hey, welcome to Film Fanatics. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. And this is going to be uh, our f- official final uh, Old Classic Month episode. And uh, in this, we decided to sort of uh, each pick a movie that in some way reflects our life. Um, so we've got some interesting choices. Um, Justin has Clerks 2 on the docket. I brought High Fidelity. But we start with the most interesting choice of all, and that is Joe's pick, The Game. Yeah. That's right. I get to start off with you. Really, the game. Is a game. You really just want to watch the, the movie. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's true. The that that's definitely the main goal here. Well, there was kind of a, a running joke. It was mentioned a few times, and we were kind of pumping out movies that uh, I hadn't gotten to put on the show, but wanted to. And I've mentioned many, but one that I've name dropped a couple times has been the game. Justin and I have had like very different opinions on the movie, and I figured you know before we were gonna like kind of wrap things up, you know possibly indefinitely. Uh, we should discuss the game, because I know that Dan hadn't seen it. Now, uh, should I talk about why, besides that? Because there is a bit of a reason why. Maybe I can get Yeah, it. please. Right, I'll, I'll get into that. I'll, I'll get into <laughs> if, that. If you can stretch it into one, I, sure. Because I, no, I, I thought I had to... Make th- a case, like, come on. Like, I did, as I was leaving, we watched it together, and I was thinking about it. I'm like, okay, I, I could see why maybe there might be some other reasons why I brought it. But in terms of the plot itself, I mean, it's a David Fincher film. It was the big one he did. Right after seven, so right after he really made a name for himself, he did this, and you know it's a uh, it's an interesting one. Basically, Michael Douglas is playing a typical Michael Douglas type, you know. <laughs> I mean, no, really, I mean it's it's Gordon Gecko, really, yeah, Gordon yeah, Gecko, falling down man, this, this falling the falling down, you know, embittered mm-hmm. corporate guy, you know, high up there, rich businessman. He's been reflecting because he's turning like forty five, I think, in the film, and he's reflecting that's like one his father committed suicide and he's not in a very good mood his wife's left him he's not really in the best business deals with other people he's kind of cutthroat he's just a pretty nasty guy but his younger brother played by sean penn who he has kind of a interesting relationship with (laughs) to uh, say the least just decides hey you know what he's such a curmudgeon i want to let him live a little i'm gonna pay for him to have this birthday present which is kind of a well it's called the game which is sort of this interactive role-playing experience that isn't really alluded to in much detail, because I guess that's part of the mystery. And in fact, any time the Douglas character decides to ask about it with people that have done it, it's just, well, it's a game. And he kind of has a general idea what it is. Like, they pull pranks on him. You know, they like they spill, you know, they, they poke a hole in his pen so that it gets, gets his shirt dirty. He has to go somewhere, and then they lock one of the suitcases so he can't go through with the meeting and then they arrange for him to have certain events like bumping into a waitress who he may have kind of a sexual possible tension with and then it kind of escalates to okay well i'm gonna carjack him and then try to run him off a bridge where he might drown but they give him a key so he might be able to get out if he maybe thought of it but if there was the possibility he couldn't he would have died so it's a very, very well thought out experience, but it gets to the point where basically his life is almost destroyed and he can't get out of the game. So in terms of why I guess I brought it, I think that the reason I really wanted to bring the game is because thinking about it, it's kind of one of the reasons I love movies because there are just so many different ways you can look at it upon thinking about it. Like it's goofy to some respects, but it's also kind of thought provoking. And uh, I was actually good going through this movie a second time as I was thinking about it even though there is kind of this big twist you kind of leave the movie thinking you know how much of it was the game how much of it was not basically mm. based on the rules of the movie and it's kind of overblown and ridiculous but it's also kind of interesting and uh, as far as the things I like about the movie I think Michael Douglas did a good job good performance I think he plays a really interesting character that has a lot of growth and I think that there's a lot of fun to be had. I think there's a lot of thrills. I think there's some laughs. I, we actually were kind of joking as we are watching. It's kind of a really, really dark comedy. But I think the best thing about it is it's a really good character study. And I, I think it takes the character into an interesting direction. It's got kind of a moral. And it has a twist that isn't easy and definitely creates conversation. But that's the main reason I wanted to bring it because the best kind of movies are not ones that you agree on everyone say are mm-hmm. the best, or ones that you can automatically divide as bad. It's the best stuff to bring a conversation for, which is what this podcast has been about, which is what reviewing movies is about, which is why we go to see movies and talk about them with our friends. And the game is a perfect example of that. Is it perfect? No. But at least it's interesting to talk about and you'll remember it. 
So that's why I brought it. Well, I won't forget it, that's for sure. Okay. Well, I, do, you, do you go to the hater or do you go to the newbie? That would no, be actually, question, no, you know it? what? You know what? Since you're fresh, I, Justin and I have talked about this before. Justin, let's talk about it. And, Dan, should we go with spoilers or no? Cause no. I don't think with this one you want to spoil it. Because it has a very unique I twist, which is, fresh. I think, the, the biggest point of where people have issues with the movie, which I can understand, but I still think you can argue against it. So I want to hear Justin's perspective because I know... I know he's got issues with the game, but I always feel confident that I can back it up with a solid argument because I know I can. I, I know I know the stuff that he could probably say, and I appreciate the arguments he's going to bring. But I think that this is a movie that's open to some interpretation with the experience, which it's is like why you're boxing yourself um, here. Come on. Well, now, well, before, I'm saying I'm I'm ready. <laughs> before we we do even go to Justin, uh, you know, in, in the old classic shows, we go old school film fanatic style. So, what is your grade? My grade. Oh, the game's an A minus for me. Okay, mm. all right. Now, Justin, I know it ain't an A minus. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> but, but I'm interested. So, is it a game? Tell me that first. Well, I mean, you just <laughs> lost it, and really, that's okay because I feel like in the game everybody loses, but <laughs> everybody loses in the game. <laughs> now, to kick us off without a generic pun. Where I want to go with this is actually something that I told you shortly after we wrapped the episode where uh, Dan reviewed your movie. And I told you, Joe, that I feel like for most directors, the first couple movies are arguably the most interesting because you're seeing you're, te- you're technically seeing somebody who hasn't really come into, the, into their form yet. That's true. And while I certainly don't think this is David Fincher's finest hour by any by any means... I respect him a lot for it. Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff he's trying to do here, but I don't think this is Fincher at his finest yet. And that's okay because obviously Alien 3 happened before this, and <laughs> eventually we found 7, but it was a long way to get there. Well, 7 was before this, though. That's that's true. So, I mean, maybe he had a, a good run before he had to stumble a bit. Yeah, I mean, you do a roller coaster, but the yeah. only work is some <laughs> of your most interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. I feel like with this one... Fincher was trying to find an absurdist, dark comedy tone. I feel like he fails miserably. And part of the problem with that is he gives us a character who is so unbelievably unlikable. And while we have moments where he kind of turns and we get more context as to why, I never found myself rooting for him. Hmm. I found myself, if anything, more disgusted at him as, as we went along, like... Okay, you have daddy issues, so do many people. What makes you particularly special? Oh, you're in a psychological thriller <laughs> that's also kind of sickly humorous in a twisted way. Mm-hmm. And and the problem is, the game is so poorly defined <laughs> that there. it's not even a matter of being thrilled. It's more like being annoyed. I I, I never found myself at the edge of my seat. I felt like... Fincher was just pricking me with a needle and hoping I got I got something out of it. So you weren't you didn't feel like there was danger at every corner? Because I mean No, I mean the game part of the problem is if you're going to throw in tension, you gotta know how the parts of the, the parts of the whole spiel work. Mm-hmm. The game is just oh it's the game. But is it always the game? Uh in the case of the game, yes, actually. The problem is the the game is so poorly defined that it's that it's obnoxious. Hmm. I mean, it's, it's definitely obnoxious, and you're right, it's definitely flexible with the definition, but that's one of the things I like about it, is that you aren't really sure what is and what is not the game, because we kind I'd of... go about 90-10 based on how they're doing it, and, and the problem know. is, because it's that it's that aspect, it's so ridiculously... You have to you have to take your suspension of, di- of disbelief and amp it to the umph degree. It's true. Because... I can't argue with that. Holy crap, there are so many things that don't make any... Any bit of sense. Straight out the gate with the wow. first one. We went four and a half years and Justin finally almost swore on the show. He was that was not an F bomb, by uh, Okay. It looked, it sounded kind there was of an F forming. I could hear it. No. This freaking big movie. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I'm getting into the negative. So let's talk about the positives on, on the flip side. I think the cinematography wise is very well done. Mm-hmm. I think I think the intent there is really interesting. Okay. The execution not so great, and I think it goes on unforgivably too long with one of the most ridiculous, nonsensical, moronic endings 
Uh, Culminating in a character arc that I frankly don't even remotely buy. Hmm. Why don't you buy it? Do you don't think? He's... I mean, part of the problem is, like I said, his he has no reason to like him. The sole reason this movie makes any modicum of it of an opportunity to like him is his dad died horribly. Okay, I I I get that. I I understand that. But does that make you a good person? Since you're you've spent the entire movie being a selfish, unlikable jerk who's been horrible to essentially everyone around him. And then you find a girl who's just as manipulative and jerkish as you are, and I guess good for you too, but... Well, I think that might be kind of sweeping, because you are right. He's not a good person. but I, I No, guess, he's a horrible individual. He's a horrible individual, but we kind of get to see him grow throughout the film. How? He, and he doesn't do bad things to every single person. He we, kind of does, we do, Joe. We, as the film progresses, you can clearly see there are moments where he does do nice There's things. There's a few things especially, that he does. Especially when he hits rock bottom, he does. Now, are these massive no, I was gonna say on a. But, but to say I'm that not there saying is none, he's pulling, you know, he's, cats from he's, buildings here, by, you know, by, on fire. By the end, but of he's the, doing things. By the end of the film, to say that he is an angel, no. But he is he is a guy. But in real life, people that are horrible do not change overnight. They have no, to no, no, I, I, I get that, but there's an art to that, and I think there's a way you build upon that instead of this movie where we have no reason to like him. We continue to have no reason to like him, and. By the end, they force a lesson on him. Do I think he got anything out of it? Not especially, but the movie seems to insist that he did. Well, I think at the very least, he learned a new perspective on his life. And by the end of the film, you are kind of questioning, as he is, what can he really consider to be reality at this point? Which I think is the most interesting thing. Yes, suspension of disbelief, but an interesting theme, at the very least. Uh, Yeah. All right. We, let's hear Justin's grade because we've been on this for twelve minutes and I haven't even talked yet. So, Justin, what what do you? Give I told the game? you to be a talker. I know, I know, and that's fine. Yeah. But I would like to at least have my two cents. No, no, no. I, <laughs> I respect that. I, I mean, I don't think it's by any means a good movie, but I like what it's trying to do, and I think Michael Douglas does do a good job with what he has. Yeah. So for those, I, I leave the game with a D plus. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so very different opinions. As I imagined, I'm. Somewhere in the middle here, um, and almost smack dab in the middle, really. Okay. Um, I I can see it from both perspectives. One thing I will always give Fincher is that he tends to leave his audiences with mixed feelings about the endings of his films. Gone Girl is a prime example of this, mm-hmm. um, and certainly the game has one of the <laughs> love it or hate it endings. I've to- and I've ever seen of all time. Totally, I mean, there's no in between. Um, and, and I understand why. I understand why on on both sides. My biggest problem with the movie is something that that Justin hit on, and it's not necessarily the dislikability of the character. It's the complete ambiguity of the game. <laughs> you know, I just the suspension of disbelief is is a part of that. Um, you know, which Justin also mentioned. Because you really, really have to just let it all go if you're going to fully embrace this movie. It's true. Because it's so vague and they never really even give you an apple, you know, of a hint uh, about what's happening because they want you to view it from his perspective, which I can appreciate. Um, but that does sort of, you know, plague the movie, I think, in some spots, because you're just like, well... You can make up anything. You can literally make up anything. Um, <laughs> Indeed. You know, Which I think so, is awesome, personally. Um, I think it has elements that are cool, but I think as sweeping as it is, the entire film is a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. Um, so I, I do knock it down some points for that. That's probably my, my biggest issue with it. The character likability issue, you know, we, we've talked about this in many, many movies, and this is a movie that only lasts really about a, not even a week, right? Or maybe a week. Maybe. Maybe. Um, definitely more than a few days, but not like a month. Oh, no. Um, so, you know, yes, there's a lot of things happening to this man. He's certainly very confused in what is happening because of the vagueness of the game. 
<laughs> so, you know, is he really expected to turn on the dime and just start saving kittens from burning buildings? Scrooge. Or is he yeah. more like, okay, I, I'm losing my mind. Like, what's going on? Yeah, that's It's important. more introspection for him than, you know, I'm going to go and prove that I'm a good person. Uh, so I, I think True. maybe that's, you know... A little bit of the disconnect between the two schools of thought there is that no, he's not a good guy, but at the same time, he doesn't know what's happening to happening to him any more than we know what's happening to him <laughs> watching it. So I I see both angles of that, but I don't think it necessarily is a huge negative for the film. Um, I leave the game with a B minus. Oh, saving grace certainly has some interesting elements, but. There's definitely a lot of problems with it, for sure. I think Douglas is good in the role, though. Oh, yeah. No, he he's one of the better you aspects know, of it, I Penn, think. Penn is not. Penn's got, like, 20 minutes of screen time, though, so. Yeah, but it's still pretty That's, good. you know. Panic. You can do Panicked many things Penn. with 20 minutes of screen time, Justin. You can. Yeah. Silence you know, of the Lambs. Here we go. But, you know. Yeah, uh, so I, I can't say that. I, I wasn't his best performance. Well, no, no but <laughs> I don't know? think anyone, even Sean Penn, uh, yeah, probably wasn't I, expecting I, milk here. I but. don't think he was really uh, giving it his all. Would you say that he wasn't game for the movie? Ooh. Fully, uh, fully game? I'd say he was penning it in. Uh. Um, but no, you know, the, the whole relationship between the two of them is... Vaguely defined. Vaguely defined. Mixed bag. Not sure by the end if I buy it. How do you um, feel about the ending, actually? You didn't really touch on that. Well, <laughs> I kind of like it, but by that point, the suspension of disbelief is so off the charts that it's sort of like, why not? Why it, not have this be the ending? <laughs> um, so I, I don't necessarily dislike it. It falls in line with the movie. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, it's fine within the context of the movie but at that point the movie has gone off the rails so far off reality <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> why not i guess uh -huh. you know so I, I i could see why you enjoy it <laughs> i could see why you don't enjoy it justin mm -hmm. um yeah i think there's room for all opinions with the game <laughs> uh, certainly you know? to say the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and i like you know great conversation i mean I, for sure. I definitely don't understand why at the time, and even to varying degrees, even now, people are like, "Oh, the game is amazing." It's, it's mediocre. Joe does say that. It's best. kind of awesome, you know. So, in your awesome opinion, might be a generous term, but you know, in your opinion, your subjective opinion, it's mediocre. I, I understand you that's know, it's, I, I, I understand I, I, it's subjectivity, I, I, Joe. You I, I, don't have to give me an ethics course I, here. But, some, sometimes I think I do. Uh, that's uh, insulting on many different levels, but I'll let uh, you go. All right, all right. But I think a movie like this that is loved or hated. <laughs> You will find those diehard people like a Joe. My friend Melissa is a huge fan of the movie. You guys well, so bonded over it at one I'm point. I'm not alone here. Um, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say it's the best movie ever. No, but, I understand but you hate is it. it. Is it a guilty pleasure movie, Joe? Or do you think it's a genuine pleasure? That's the hard part, honestly. Because I think for me, my positive grade is more on the guilty pleasure level because I did enjoy watching it, but it's pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. But art house nerds love it, and it is certified fresh. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, this is the thing. I'll I'll, I'll give yeah, you a, a, a lot of guilty pleasures. Are. Well, I'll expand a little bit for you guys. Magic Mike, I think, is like, a good example. Upon thinking about it, I I actually realized bad, that it's a movie that I still have to think about because, and that's one of the reasons it's I a like thinker. it. It's it's not one that I clearly get everything. I have to come back to it. And when I originally saw the film. I thought it was fantastic. I did. You know, I really did. Like like Justin said, I would have been like, oh, man, it's, it's one of the best things ever. Do I still think it is now? No. It is, it's full of dumb moments. But I don't care. I mm -hmm. enjoy it because I can do, put my suspension to leap out there and have fun watching the movie. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with just enjoying a movie purely for entertainment. And at the end of the day, no matter what your opinion is on a movie, just have fun. I enjoyed it. Everybody uh, okay, has but here's the thing, though, Joe. The game takes itself deadly seriously and hopes that you will too. Armageddon, which is probably one of the one of if not the poster child for suspend your disbelief as far as humanly possible. Yeah. Understands that it's dumb, doesn't expect you to think it's smart, and just lets you, lets you roll with that. The yeah. game thinks it's brilliant. Well, you know what? Once again, I think that's viewer perspective. Like, no, no, no. They legitimately do think. Well, the game is this incredibly intelligent, well thought out psychological thriller. They well, 
look, I don't know 100% what the intentions are. Did David Fincher ever say this? I don't know. I'm pretty sure Michael Bay thought that he, his movie was really serious. Have you seen some of his interviews? So I don't know, man. I think I think that's hard to determine, too. <laughs> I think you're right. Does this movie take itself more seriously than Armageddon? Yeah, but I don't know. <laughs> I think, I think, I think pretty... Armageddon took itself pretty seriously, and I think the game takes itself pretty seriously. I think these are both examples of directors who are <laughs> I mean, making a serious, I, in their mind, film. I mean, I can think mm, of some examples example, where, but... you know, I might think I was making a serious movie, and it wasn't. So, yeah, I, I can say from that perspective, you know, maybe I have a little bit of uh, experience there. So, nobody really knows what the director's thinking, unless they say so, you know. Uh, all right. Well, we've we've talked to death about the game. We certainly have. I think I think we're we're uh, to. never going to come to an agreement on that. Yeah, but I fine. kind of figured that's how it would be. I, I yeah. felt like I would probably be somewhere in the middle there. Um, I had no idea whether you were going to love it or hate it. To be honest, because this little is both. This is one of those movies. There's I I don't know. It's a little of both. I don't know, man. Many perspectives. Um, all right. Well, hopefully there's a little more consensus on my movie because I think that this was. Uh, Always meant to be taken seriously as a comedy. Uh, yeah, yeah. But with some dramatic moments as well. <laughs> uh, and that is High Fidelity. This is a movie that uh, was on my list on the very first episode of the show when we talked about movies that uh, kind of reflected our life, which I'll get into. Uh, but in this movie, Rob Gordon, record store owner, is played by John Cusack, and he's just gone through one of the worst breakups of his life and reflect back on some of the other big relationships, the ones that really hurt even talking to some of them over the course of the film. Meanwhile, his two employees, played by Jack Black and Todd Luizzo, are moving forward with their own lives, as Rob's seems to be at a standstill, and he attempts to get his girlfriend, Laura, played by Ibn Hajiji, I believe, back. Tim Robbins supports as Laura's new boyfriend, and Lisa Bonet, Catherine Zeta-Jones, and, of course, Joan Cusack <laughs> also have supporting roles. Joan! Here. Uh, always showing up in the best of the Cusack films. Mm -hmm. uh, this is based on the, bu the book by Nick Hornby, one of my favorite writers. Now, I've never read any of his books, but he also wrote the book about a boy, and he wrote the screenplays for Wild and Brooklyn. So, How about that? no surprise here. I'm ah. a fan. This is a great film. Um, but why is it me, specifically? Uh, this is a movie that I actually hadn't seen until it uh, premiered on DVD, or possibly VHS. I think maybe is more correct. Mm -hmm. I think I rented it. Um, but when it was in theaters, this is the the first film that people were telling me, you got to see this movie. This dude is you. you know. And I didn't really understand what that meant until I watched the film. The the list, the top five listing is the most obvious go-to. You know, Cusack has a top five list for everything. Uh, his, his music collection is incredibly organized to an almost um, anal retentive, you know, the making of the mix tapes and, and having a specific, you know, format for that. Uh, the owning of a record store. You know, at the time I worked at a record store, and uh, that would not have been an out-of-the-question possibility for me to own a record store if uh, record stores kind of stuck around. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in, in many ways I see a lot in this character and as well the emotional level of this character going, you know, sort of from one extreme to the other. In certain instances, uh, a very funny dream sequence featuring the Tim Robbins character. Very funny. Um, you know, very funny, very me. So I think it definitely fits. Uh, the movie itself... I think it's great. I think the comedy works the whole movie, whether it's subtle comedy, broad comedy, slapstick humor. You know, the Jack Black character has, you know, some crazy lines. Uh, you know, he's kind of the, the madcap of the crew. Um, but it all sort of works. They all kind of jibe together. I don't know uh, necessarily the other guy, this Todd Luizzo who plays uh, the other gentleman, but the camaraderie <laughs> between the three of them is is great. Um, you know, from working at record stores and from working at Hot Topic, I mean, you know, the the camaraderie is there. The talking about music, talking about life, talking about this and that. Uh, you know, this is where you'll find this kind of stuff in a mom and pop record store. Um, and so I, I think that's cool. I think uh, his arc is incredible. And here's a person who goes through a very good arc in, you know, I would say maybe a month, month and a half, possibly even more. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, yeah, that's a good right. time to have that, ki that kind of an arc. Yeah. 
and and not that he's necessarily unlikable at the beginning of the film. I mean, the first scene we see is them breaking up. Mm-hmm. We don't necessarily know why. We don't know who's at fault. He's not a bad character, but he is certainly at a standstill. And, uh, you know, various things kind of kick him into gear. And I think all of us have been there uh, at some point or another. So this, for me, is is just one of the great uh, comedies of the last 15 or 20 years. It's an A-plus for me. Wow. Justin? <laughs> Uh, we, I, we had all seen this before, right? I know you yes, had. Yes. You saw it, right, Joe? Once. Once, okay. So I kind of view this one as a romantic comedy that's not really a romantic comedy, but still in a weird way kind of a romantic comedy. It's kind of like a silver <laughs> linings in that respect. <laughs> Considerably, yes. And I think with this one, there's a lot of different working parts. I agree he does have a good arc, though i got to admit, I think at two hours it runs on 20, 30 minutes too long. I think there are, wow. I think there's a couple moments slash pl- subplots that don't need nearly as much attention as they as they go into like a, a few of his other relationships and a couple other aspects along those lines lisa but doesn't need to be in the film i agree <laughs> not <especially. laughs> but really where the movie <laughs> where the movie comes together is with is, is with john cusack's character growth and pretty much the interplay between his uh his two co-stars as far as the romantic aspect of it goes, particularly with the resolution, I don't think it works quite as well as it likes to think it does. Hmm. Like, okay, we start off with a negative. Now, I guess they're making it work. You know, I think that's one of the most believable aspects of the film, honestly. It might not. It's one of those things I think it's a person-by-person basis, but I could no, see no, no. it I, happening. I, I agree, but... For me, personally, I don't know, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean yeah. most of the time when that happens, it doesn't end well, but... There are exceptions to every rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I... that, that's definitely the part of the movie that's more spirited and upbeat and uh, maybe not quite as believable. Well, because it's only... Like we said, about a month and a half or so. Mm. We don't know what happens to them yeah, after yeah, the movie. Yeah, it could regress right. again. I, I don't like, know about you, but well, I know plenty of people who have broken well, up very horribly and got back together within a short amount of time. Yeah, but... Whether they stay together or not. My, my impression of that not plot point, Justin, maybe you agree, is kind of like due to the situation of what just happened, I felt like that kind of made it easier for them to come back mm-hmm. together. It I don't so I don't Alongside know. that, I, I don't think they particularly had chemistry. Like I think part of the issue with that whole that whole romantic subplot is, oh, they they did have something, but whenever they're on screen together, that I don't feel like I don't honestly don't feel like they ever really click. Mm-hmm. It's like waiting for something to happen and nothing really comes from it. But mm. but they keep pushing it forward, like oh yes, it, it, don't don't you worry, viewers, it it, it will happen. Mm-hmm. Well, most of the movie they're in a pretty tense state. Like I said, the first scene is them breaking up, so. Yeah, but usually if you're going to go that route, you got to give us at least something and say like, "Oh yes, there's some." If you are going to go with that, that parallel, make us see something that. Oh yes, there was there is something worth saving here. Okay. And I don't think I don't particularly think High Fidelity does a good job of salvaging that. Though honestly, <clears throat> in spite of his love interest, I think the I think he does a good job. I think the supporting cast does a great job, and as to be expected, the soundtrack is amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great soundtrack. No, no doubt there. I, yeah, I didn't even think that uh, needed yeah. to be mad. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> man. That's why I didn't say it. Music. I mean, that's the cla- Yeah, music, it's a great music, soundtrack. Music. Yeah. But, I mean, when the humor's there, it works in spades. It's got some great one-liners. Honestly, if it was probably like an hour 40 minutes, hour 30, this movie probably would have been like an A- minus for me. But as a whole, as it's constructed now, I'd prob- I would probably leave it with a B plus. All right, Joe. Well, uh, I definitely agree with what you guys say. I, I think that it's a, it's a definitely a very well constructed movie. I could definitely see the connection to you, Dan, as I was watching it. Mm-hmm. Some things crossed my mind, so I think it was a good pick there for sure. Thanks. Uh, I think that I really I think the strong point of the movie for me is Cusack's performance and his delivery, and just the way the story is told, kind of with the the open narration directly to us with flashbacks. Kind of yeah, a lot cy- of good fourth wall breaking, oh, yeah. yep. cycling through with the events of the film that are occurring in you know the the actual main timeline. I thought it was kind of cool, so I thought it flowed well. I thought it was paced well. I thought it was pretty funny. I thought that the characters were pretty 
believable and realistic for the most part. Uh, really, I had a great time watching, and I definitely liked some of the uh, the romantic stuff, and I think the relationship stuff is, of course, relatable, and, you know, just uh, the general human condition stuff, and even the idea of, you know, loving things and a fandom and all that. I, I think there was a lot of good stuff touched on there. Uh, the I do think that uh, it's not so much that I think the romance was necessarily unbelievable, but I felt like there was a lot of jumping around of each part to kind of go through it. Like, that's what the movie was about, his introspection based on that. And then towards the end, it's kind of like, we're going to focus more on this relationship. And it never really felt like we got enough time with her before to really see everything. Like, we got snippets of it, but I do feel like by the end, it, it does feel a little odd there together. Like, maybe it is the chemistry, too. A little bit. Uh, yeah, a, a smidge. It wasn't a big deal for me, but I could kind of see that. And also, just another minor thing. Uh, I really like the Jack Black, another character. And I, I think they had good arcs, but I feel like they could have been in the movie a little more. Or they could have cemented their relationship a little bit more, perhaps. Mm. So, I think there was a little bit of unbalance. There's a lot of working parts already, though. There there are. Uh, but, like I said, I think that it gets like super focused at the end. And it feels like it's slightly a different movie. Mm. You know? But... Overall, it was paced well. It was a good experience. Very, very well done overall. I think it might be my favorite Cusack performance. Oh, it's de- yeah, it's definitely mine. I mean, the guy only has about three good ones. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> so. But I remember I saw this uh, years and years ago, and I couldn't really get into it. Really, I didn't like it that much. But I think being a little older and looking at it again, I think it's one of those movies uh, like uh, it, was it one of the the pain movies we talked about Sideways? Yes. Where where yeah, like we all kind of saw Sideways when we were like a bit younger, like early 20s, mid 20s for me. And then watching it again on the show, you know, 10 years later or whatever, gave us all kind of a different perspective. I think the first time I might have seen High Fidelity, I might have been 16, 17. Right. So I kind of liked it, but I think I can relate more to it now. Yeah, Because for sure. You know, and and I think that might have something to do with specific audience. But on the whole, I really liked it. A couple minor flaws maybe, but I thought it was a really, really good movie. I couldn't find anything. I leave it with an A myself. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was good. Good one, too. That was very good. Yeah, I mean, th- this came out when I was, what, 24 or something, 23. Mm. So, I mean, uh-huh. kind of right in that age range. I think his character's a little older, but... Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I think at 16, it's one of those movies where, yeah, I, I don't know if it can be fully appreciated... I don't think so. Uh, for, ...for what it is. It can be funny. Yeah, the f- I think the humor was you know, good, but... And you can dig the soundtrack. Soundtrack, oh, think it, question. As far as the Hopefully. emotional connection... I don't think, yeah, you, you, that a person would be quite there yet. I don't think so. Yeah. What do you think, Justin? Probably not. Not, not especially. Yeah. So maybe, maybe there is a timing with that one. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, finally is uh, Justin's Clerks two. <laughs> now that that was an interesting choice. I did not see coming. Since the twelve years since we last saw them, Dante and Randall, Brian, played by Brian O'Halloran and Jeff Anderson, uh, are still clerks until a fire sends them off to work and the corporate fast food chain by virtue of the universe movies. As Dante may be getting out of the clerk life for good, Randall prepares for one wild evening to send him off. Rosario Dawson joins the series, and Jason Mewes and Kevin Smith himself return as Jay and Silent Bob. So, how to end a major chapter of Film Fanatics? This was a question that honestly has been plaguing me for about the last month. And I thought of a couple different ideas. I thought about trying to think of something that embodies the spirit of of Film Fanatics, which I thought of a good one, but it's a little left field. Though you could probably argue this one is as well. I thought of possibly doing one that was long overdue, The Tree of Life, just to have the final throwdown. No. But I I can't in good conscience end it on a, on a bloodbath. Fair but enough. really... All of a sudden, like halfway through this month, it just hit me. I would have been pissed if you were in the Tree of Life. I would have thought it was awesome. As your last movie. That really would have made I've me I've been angry. aching him to do it for, for years. And the simple answer is, go back to the beginning. And by the beginning, I don't mean episode one, Film Fanatics. I mean the beginning of what I'm going to refer to as simply episode zero of what got the wheels turning. So when Dan and I first knew each other, got to know each other in, in 2012, I... Uh, I found his movie list online. I thought it was amazing. I asked him about it. We hit it off and slowly but surely became friends. It was a pretty good list. It was a pretty awesome list. <laughs> but uh, I don't get the joke. <laughs> Just complimenting my own list. That's all. Not, not to bash something like that. <laughs> but yes. Oh, jeez. Ego stroking. <laughs> it was a pretty good list, I have to admit. <laughs> and the original Clerks is on there, yes. Yes. But um, 
pretty much time passed and uh, we decided to get together for a movie night. And honestly, our first big uh, thing to get the wheels turning was actually since everybody at the time was working at Abregal, our foray into retail, Clerks seemed appropriate and we had a pretty good time. So for me, I've always thought Clerks 2 was a little bit better because not that I don't like the nihilistic absurdism from the original, hmm. but I, I like where this one takes sort of the aspect of what do you want versus what do you need? And how do the two intertwine and how do you sort of wrestle with that with that dilemma? What, how do we define success? And I think, particularly as I'm getting older, how do I, how do I answer that? Mm-hmm. And I, I won't deny the fact that Clerks 2 is definitely more juvenile. It's a bit more mainstream. But it still feels like Clerks, which I really do appreciate. Mm-hmm. The The characters are still in, in top form. There's some really, really great jokes. <laughs> None of which we can air on, on the show, obviously, but... <laughs> most <laughs> but, of them, yeah. But most of them, yes. But uh, Transformers the, is funny. <laughs> Transformers <laughs> is very funny. Elias is a great new character as well. But, <laughs> mm-hmm. but for me, I think, really, the best stuff happens in the last, I'm going to say, like, 10, 15 minutes... Where it actually takes a surprisingly more serious and and very touching note, like okay, is is success getting getting a high paying job and being around people, or is or is just being successful hanging out with friends and having a good time? Hmm. There's a lot of different components to that, and I I like the way it explores that aspect in a in a mature and in a mature by clerk standards, way. <laughs> not point. not not mature mature. But <laughs> nice save, Justin. I got you. No, I know what you meant. <laughs> but no, I think it's a very worthy sequel. I'm still sad Clerks Three may not ever happen. But <sighs> as we sort of noted as as the film was wrapping up, it it, it resolves most of the things that I would have liked to have seen them explore in, in another installment. Mm-hmm. But who knows? I I leave this one with a very well deserved A. Oh wow, Joe. Man, Clerks 2. Uh, yeah, like I said, definitely a very interesting choice. I liked it, um, but I, I wasn't sure about it because Clerks 2 is one of those films that like I kind of go back and forth on in my mind. Uh, I think that, I agree. I think the best part of the movie is actually when it does get more dramatic at the end. Mm-hmm. The characters kind of explore where they were from the original film to where they are now. And everything Justin said is definitely correct. And I think that for their character growth, specifically for Dante and Randall, it's really great. Um, then there's everything else about the movie, which, which, which isn't, which isn't n- bad. Do continue, it's, Joe. It's not bad, but this is Kevin Smith. This is still Clerks. It's really raunchy. Uh, and in some ways it's actually much raunchier than the first film, which is surprising. Oh, that's, that's not even a question. It, it goes, you know, I guess, and you could argue if this is sort of a cap to it, it's, it's definitely going high and maybe too far for some people. But then again, controversy is something that smith is fine with so i think the the big argument against clerks too has always kind of been does it really feel like clerks because it feels like a more mainstream standard comedy kind of of the early 2000s which you could see along your american pies and old schools and i look when i want look at clerks too i'm like these are the characters from clerks with some of the humor from clerks definitely but the style doesn't really feel quite the same but then again, it's done intentionally. I mean, I'd, I'd argue the animated series was much more of a, a betrayal of the Clark style. But uh, I actually haven't seen much of it, so I'll I you you can let me know. I don't know it, it, if it, it, don't they get like more cartoony than that? Because yeah, animated? it's it's very cartoony. It's very like sketch based. But I could see some elements of that here. Like there are definitely some pockets where it feels very sketch based, and I don't know. It, it's funny, but I don't know how much of it is necessarily true to clerks i think some of it really is and some of it's just kind of there to get a reaction uh the gosh i can't even say it the the biggest example being kind of right before the the final act you mm-hmm. know kind of the impetus into the, the final the show the show aspect is the is sort and that's of, all we'll say about is, that <laughs> the show is is a big conversation point and for good reasons but i like the movie i like its message i think if there was an end to this particular story it could work but still open to the sequel uh, but hearing you think that it's better than the first one is is unique. Uh, I don't know. I've always felt that they were kind of even personally, mm-hmm. but for different reasons. You know, I th- okay. I think this is a good fun movie. I leave it with a B plus. Okay. Uh, yeah, for me, it's it's definitely not on par with the original. I mean, the original is uh, honestly in a, in a league by itself uh, because of its uniqueness at the time. By the time Clerks Two came around, this was. 
12 years later? Yep. Something to that effect. Long right. time. You know, you had your Seinfelds where they sat around and talked about nothing. You had, you know, <laughs> Friends where they sat around and talked about nothing. You know, you had a lot of A lot things, of knockoffs. A lot of knockoffs. Not that Seinfeld and Friends were knockoffs. knockoffs oh, no, no, no. But... It's a, that vein of 90s look, nihilism, you know, yeah. In 1994, when this movie came out, and I've, you know, mentioned this many times on the show and off, you know, that I saw it in theaters, because I'm very proud of that. Nothing like it. Um, because there was nothing like it at the time. And we didn't even know what it was going into it. We, we, I saw it reviewed on Ebert, and I thought, looks kind of weird, but interesting. Let's go. And it really it really colored my film-going experience for years to follow because it was so unique. It was the first movie that me and my friends had that was ours. Our parents never even heard of it. You know, we'd quote the lines to each other. Nobody knew what we were talking about. And and that really, I think for me and for a lot of people who follow who have followed Kevin Smith's career for twenty plus years, feel that way yeah. about Clerks. Clerks two is hampered by the fact that it's more mainstream. But you know when you guys are saying you know the animated series was sketch based, this is sketch it's a little bit sketchy. So was the first movie. You know, you have the the people at the video store, you know, where he's rattling off all the porn titles on the phone. Huh. You know, you have the, the woman at the at the uh, stop. What's it called? The quick stop. Yes. You know, uh, looking at the milk. You have the hockey sketch. I mean, it, it's all kind of sketch based when you think about it. Yes, they're all kind of you know threads of ideas and friendships and everything. But there's, I think, both have a lot of sketch nature to them. Now. This one's song number sort of sets it apart from the yeah, other ones. So that's like one scene. Though. Um, but you know what? It's it's a good scene. I think it, it is works. Very good scene. You know, um, it's it's one of my favorite out of the blue song moments in a movie. I think it's right up there with Five Hundred Days of Summer. Um, I, I definitely call Roll Funny on it, you know, like Spider Man Three, notwithstanding. Yeah, <laughs> did, yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I had man, to do it, Joe. Come on. I had to bring it back. Every Inappropriate song um, numbers. Here we go. It is the best. But, you worst, know, best, um, worst one, one good thing about this movie that the first one doesn't have is familiarity. Yes. We okay. know these characters. We know the um, the cameos. You know, you got your Jason Lee. You got your Affleck. You got yep. your Wanda Sykes. It's not, you know, a, a, a known <laughs> Smith cameo, but her cameo is great as well. Definitely. For me, the, the biggest flaw uh, is... Smith's wife in real life, uh, whatever her real name is, who plays Dante's fiance, is such an incredibly bad actress that it ruins every single scene she's in. She's not good. She's okay. not good. And, you know, good good for you, Kevin Smith, for putting all your family members in your movies. It didn't work for you in Yoga Hosers or uh, <laughs> Tusk. I, I don't think it worked here either. She r- ruins the scenes that she's in. And that, for me, is a big sticking point because if somebody was bad in the original Clerks, well, guess what? They weren't really getting paid to be no. in the movie, you know? True. They were Smith's friends. Okay, cool. I accept it. Here, it just sticks out like a sore thumb because everybody else is pretty competent. Yes. You know, even in, and these, then there's her. Even in their, these silly roles, and then there's her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I will say this about this particular viewing because the last time I'd seen this was maybe five or six years ago, uh, there were references that I never got the first time around, uh, including the uh, Buffalo Bill song um, <laughs> that, that they play. I thought it was funny, but I didn't get the reference right. you know, until we until we watched it. So th- there's an example. But I agree. I think the dramatic notes in the last you know, 10 or 15 minutes uh, make, make the movie what it is. Uh, it's not on par with the original Clerks, but... I do think it's a really, really solid follow-up. I'm going to give it an A-. minus. Okay. I gave it an A originally. In fact, I saw this in theaters two days in a row because um, I had two different friends that wanted to see it. But mm. but that that wife, just she, she knocks she's it bad. down. <laughs> she knocks it down because she's yeah. in four or five scenes and she's just terrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah. But good. I mean, it's, a, you know, very... For a sequel, it's definitely up there. Yeah. For a comedy sequel... It's certainly up there. I can't think yeah. of too many better ones. Good choice, though. Yeah. No, thank you. It was, it was good seeing it again, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if we need a Clerks 3, but I was kind of sad to hear that it probably isn't happening. Mm. You know? That's true. I mean, I, I just want to see Smith get back on track because 
Well, last couple I've not. This been is doing the it. last really good, good one. one. Yeah, even even just good one. Yeah. Like I I enjoyed Second Mary. I don't think it was anything close. No, to this. I guess Second Mary was good. That's You're right. Not really view askew though. No, no, no. It's it's not no, a but just in general. But it's still Smith filmography. Yeah. I mean, did did you like uh, Red State or do you? I I was okay with Red State. I never saw Red I, State. I kind of liked Red State, but I, I know a lot of people didn't like it. I could see why. Um, but yeah, I, I would say this is the last great Smith movie. On that weekend, for agree. sure. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. True. Uh, all right. Well, that uh, will wrap it up for our our final old classic month. Uh, some interesting choices for sure. Uh, some <laughs> some good chats. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, and we'll leave it there. So thanks so much for listening. And uh, we'll see you back here for our final show, which uh, will be the Logan review and sort of a uh, wrap up of Film Fanatic. So thanks for listening, and we'll see you then.